Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us this morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm going to give everyone a moment or so to <clears throat> trickle in, but hello, welcome. I am Nellie Stansbury, Denison Consulting's Marketing Manager. I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's discussion in our monthly webinar series. Today's session is the first in a series on building and leveraging innovation in today's shifting work landscape. And I am joined by two members of the Denison team, Brian Atkins and Margaret Corman. Thank you both for being with us. As we give folks another moment or so to filter in, please do test out the functionality of the Q&A and chat features below and share where you are joining us from. I encourage everyone to utilize these features throughout the discussion as I will be looking through your questions for us to talk through at the end of our session when we have dedicated some time for Q&A. I will now turn things over to Margaret and Brian to get us started. Well, hello again, I'm Margaret. Uh, Brian and I are gonna chat with you a bit uh, today about um, some work that we found near and dear to not only our firm, but what our clients are going through um, in today's transforming world. So our topic today is, this, is the notion of strategic choice and hybrid work. As uh, around the world, we're still trying to understand a confusing and complex world um, you know, with the global pandemic and many other dynamics that we have in our economic landscape. And so Brian and I are, we'll talk with you a little bit about this notion of strategic choice and what does this look like as well as uh, now what does this look like for us in the hybrid workplace as we think about transforming our cultures and our leadership practices. Um, one of the pieces that um, we have found really interesting as I'm sure many of our audience members all, um, have found too is just this the world transforming in general. And these are five mega trends that um, economists from the Bank of America have found. And I think what's interesting or what we wanna draw your attention to is this notion of the digital transformation and just the, the pace and acceleration um, and how that's impacted, how organizations are not only operating but adapting to the changing environment. So this notion of you know, big data, artificial intelligence, um, as well as the impact of you know, this working from home and the e-commerce, how that's really you know, shifted uh, the way in which uh, we partner with each other, we set up our you know, global systems, our supply chains, et cetera. I think the other um, interesting mega trend that we want to highlight is just you know, the new consumer. Um, we have Generation Z that has entered into the workplace um, along with our you know, millennials and, and boomers and you know, just their shifts in their needs and communications and their expectations um, around the organization. To that end, um, the Bank of America also has some interesting data around for the first time in organizational life, we have five generations that can be operating within the organization. Uh, there's actually a couple studies going on right now in some of the federal agencies in the United States that are looking at communication patterns and cross-generational uh, project management teams. And, you know, just pointing out a couple of interesting ones, you know, here is just is the notion of communication styles. If you think about having a multi-generational um, workforce and multi-generational project teams that are geographically dispersed, you know, Generation X's preference is more towards, you know, emailing, uh, where millennials more instant messaging and the Gen Z into emojis. The digital uh, proficiency levels, you know, is varies across it with boomers being more the digital Im immigrants um, to digital adopters to uh, millennials as digital natives and Gen Z's as digital uh, inmates, as they're calling them. And then also the use of, you know, social media and, and digital media and how we are connecting um, Gen Xers into LinkedIn, Gen Zers into TikToks, you know, and the different key life questions. And I think as leaders and managers in organizations, having an understanding of um, 
how our workforce, what motivates them, how, you know, preferences towards communication styles and how that impacts um, how we're framing out our culture, building a strong culture or cohesive culture is something we wanna be keeping in mind. This is all in this context of the notion of the VUCA world, um, which isn't a new term. Uh, the military you know, has had it before, but this idea that the environment is now more than ever, even more complex, more vile, volatile, more ambiguous and more uns uncertain. And so how do we think about you know, our strategic planning and strategizing when we know that there is more uncertainty now than ever before. There's more you know, equivocality um, going on. So this brings us to our topic uh, that we're gonna talk about today, or at least the first part of it. So how are we thinking about strategic choice that we have um, in our organizations in, in the world that's transforming? Keeping in mind, we've got these emerging trends that are going on. Um, around hybrid innovations, how we're thinking through our partnerships and this migration from networks to more of this notion of these eco ecosystems or micro ecosystems, as well as the digitalization and who's been able to you know, jump on those emerging opportunities. And so what we're seeing across um, organizations around the world is this shift from strategy to strategizing. And that's not a new idea. Uh, Henry Minsberg was talking about strategizing you know, 25 years ago, but this calls into play more the need for this because if we're in an uncertain environment, the notion that you can lock in a strategic plan or have an annual strategic planning process um, really puts your organization in a different place if there is dynamic, unpredictable change that's going on. So we still might have value propositions and we want to be thinking through our competitive advantage and still going through the process of formulating strategy and implementing strategy. It now evolves to being this more ongoing dynamic process. And associated with that is thinking through our values and expected behaviors you know, that are connected to how do we transform our cultures. One of the... Um, ways in which we can be thinking about strategy um, as Michelle from the IMD is talking about this notion of the agile strategic process and transformation. More this idea of organizations having a portfolio of strategic initiatives and that they're continuing to evaluate these initiatives in an ongoing regular basis, whether those are through quarterly meetings or, or, or monthly, monthly hackathons there's a whole bunch of different types of initiatives or efforts that different organizations can do. Um, what this does though is enhance the complexity at which you have some sort of governance across the organizations because these strategic initiatives require integration and coordination across the organization. So these are often um, initiatives that are cross-functional. So having dialogue throughout across the organization um, and across these functional areas becomes a really important piece during a more strategizing or agile strategic strategy process. And so we're seeing this shift away from annual planning cycles, thinking, oh, all right, here it is August, we're coming up on our annual planning cycle, to organizations and our clients now thinking more about, hey, we need to have ongoing strategies, and maybe we should have these quarterly reevaluations or check-ins and and re-examine our criteria for how we're gonna prioritize our strategic initiatives. So um, let me just stop there. And what we thought we would do at this point is maybe just throw up a poll to our audience. And if you were to um, share with us, how's your organization thinking about their strategic planning process? Our, have they just not started because they're barely hanging in there trying to keep the, the wheels on? Um, are they, is your organization starting to resume the strategic planning process right now? You know, what they had in place and they're going, okay, we need to get back to it. Or is your organization starting to say, maybe we need to be rethinking it 
uh, not knowing what it's going to look like, um, but maybe we need to be a little bit more agile given the VUCA world that we're in and that it's transforming and we have a lot more uncertainty. Or has your organization already shifted? They've recognized the need to have a more dynamic process with this portfolio of strategic initiatives. So let's give everybody a second. If you could uh, select one of those um, where your organization is today in July, you know, 2021, and let's see what our audience says. All right, so let's take a look at the results here. So it looks like um, we've got some distribution across uh, organizations are now starting to re-engage in the strategic planning process. Our highest percent is that um, leaders are starting to rethink, um, are we, you know, what is our process and how might we make it more adaptive uh, to the VUCA world? Um, next, it looks like the next highest portion is more of we're returning back, at least getting back in the game of doing, you know, having our what our strategic planning process was. And then we have about a quarter that are saying, hey, we've already shifted and we've built in a more dynamic um, process with ongoing dialogues. And we're building in a way to recalibrate throughout the year. Um, so Brian, thoughts on this, or um, Nelly, any comments in our chat box, or anybody else want to jump in? Well, just a couple of uh, very quick reactions. I mean, this certainly seems pretty aligned with what we're seeing and hearing with a lot of our clients. There are still some of those organizations that, you know, are perhaps because of their industry or their business were hit pretty hard, and so there's still a bit in that keep the wheels on mode. Um, but I think there's also, and we see it here, almost a third of the respondents who are saying, you know, our hope is to get back on track. So less of a, you know, necessarily thinking of it as a bounce forward activity, but how do we get back on track with something that perhaps worked well for us in the past? And so maybe there's a good case to continue with that. But certainly, you know, well over half of the folks uh, who responded saying that, you know, we are, we're rethinking the strategy, the strategy process, thinking about how to make this a bit more dynamic, uh, because I'm sure they had to act in a pretty dynamic way over the past year. So I think it's, I think it's very consistent with what we've seen and experienced in the marketplace thus far. Great. Uh, Nellie, any comments in the chat box or... Yeah, we, had, oh. we had someone um, just read in from the chat that they were answering the poll from the perspective of what they were hearing from their clients. So, right. Yeah. Now we'll go ahead and go to um, get it to move. One of the other um, aspects associated with this a more agile um, strategy process are these three dimensions, you know, wondering what's the commitment, you know, to be ready for a different type of process, what's our capacity um, to be able to engage in that, and lastly, what's the cultural readiness for that. Um, so for each of these three areas, um, again, your commitment, um, to what extent would you say leaders throughout the organization would support changing that, uh, changing how you're thinking through your strategic planning process, um, the capacity of the organization, uh, the type of knowledge, expertise, and resources that your organization has to facilitate implementing. We're always great on formulating strategy, but it's the implementation that's often the Achilles heel in strategic planning. And lastly, is this notion of cultural readiness, you know, to what extent is there strategic alignment between, you know, these priorities, organizational priorities, and then the expected behaviors and norms um, of the organization versus current, the current norms. So let's take a few minutes and um, 
for each of these three dimensions around strategic agility, have our audience you know, weigh in on uh, where they're understanding their organization is in terms of you know, their commitment, their capacity, and then the cultural readiness um, to shift to a more agile uh, strategic planning process with strategic choice. These are just uh, a one, two, and three. Below, we're not there. Medium, kind of there. Or uh, high, we're there. And as those are results are coming in and we're able to see uh, in real time as people are responding, you know, good to see that uh, not too many organizations are feeling like their leaders are not committed. That's a pretty low percentage. It looks like it'll end up being. Uh, but, you know, still some folks, a lot of folks in that medium range, but let's see where we fall out. All right, a lot of mediums. <laughs> Often the case, so um, having a general sense that yeah, uh, leaders might be committed. Um, you know, we've got some of the readiness capabilities, um, although you know some saying you know that's on the low end. Um, what's interesting here is from seventy percent um, say that there is you know this cultural readiness of you know the organization around expected behavioral norms um, and current norms. Um, so that that's interesting to see that, see that trend. So commitment, capacity, and cultural readiness. And I think those are things for organizational leaders and you know, even consultants who are working with organizations and helping them to reflect on and prepare for um, engaging in a different type of you know, dialogue around, is it an annual strategy, strategic planning process, and or do we want to build in a hybrid model where we have some ongoing dialogues and recalibrations and, and reflecting on our criteria for what makes it um, as an organizational priority at different quarterly interviews uh, and intervals. Yeah, and just to, to follow up and make a, a comment on that, I think what we saw in the past uh, poll as well as this one, uh, it, it really does speak to the fact that, you know, so many organizations, leaders, people in organizations are, you know, rethinking a lot of things. They're trying to figure out a lot of things. I think that's one of the important aspects of this series of webinars that we're going to be doing is that we all recognize we're learning. Uh, day in, day out. Uh, we're learning together how to navigate through a lot of change in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and our goal is to really be able to help learn along the way, share some things that we see work and help wrestle with some of the questions that we're all struggling with. So I think uh, it speaks to where we are today. Yeah, Brian, I, I mean, that um, makes me think about um, I think the Denison firm does an annual um, culture survey um, and for their dimensions or their traits, actually the organizational learning and adaptability um, area was, you know, one of the stronger areas, you know, that, um, you know, people are responding to in terms of the firm and how they're understanding or wanting to be adaptable and taking some of these lessons learned as well as the you know, integration, coordination across the organization and collaborative knowledge sharing and collaboration and communication across. Are you find, are you seeing a shift with some of the other clients in terms of that type of, you know, attention or emphasis on, you know, both being attuned to learning about the external environment, and reflecting on that, as well as, you know, building in more collaborative practices or processes inside the organization yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a mix and I think it's kind of a mix of, uh, as we've seen represented here, where a number of the organizations we talk to 
are at a place and, and we all recognize that certainly all the changes related to the pandemic are not resolved and that, you know, as we're seeing certainly in the US and, and around the world, uh, you know, this continues to affect how we think about and do the work that we do. Uh, and so, you know, I think we still find a fair amount of organizations that are still trying to figure out how they keep doing what it is they doing they, they do and uh, you know, sort of sort of keeping the wheels on um, but i do think like us as an organization we had to we had to make some changes pretty quickly we had to in march of 2020 rethink a lot of the ways that we do the work that we do and so whether it was plan change, whether it was innovation towards uh, a new unique way of doing things, adding more value, or just change and in innovation to simply figure out how do we do what we've already been doing. Uh, I think that's where a lot of organizations are today. I think the other part of what we wanted to talk about today is you know, what we're seeing in these hybrid work environments you know, and what are some of, you know, the lessons learned from leaders and different practices and stuff. And so um, let's go ahead and we'll switch gears um, and talk a little bit more about, you know, what's happening, what are some of the trends and challenges, you know, around this? Okay. Yeah, and um... You know, there's a few things that we'll touch on in the remainder of our time. You know, one of those uh, that I'll speak to, and we can just speak to it from this slide here, is the culture in a VUCA world. You know, uh, I, I thought it would be important that as we're talking about these things, whether it's hybrid work, innovation, and in organizations, that I bring it back to culture for just a moment. Um, because you know, I was recently talking to a leader in an organization who said to me, uh, and I'll quote him, he said, you know, if everyone is working remotely, then we no longer have a culture. <clears throat> and in, in some respects, that comment, I think encapsulates some of the struggle that a lot of us are wrestling with in today's you know, VUCA environment, as you described it, Margaret. And, you know, so as we're launching the series about hybrid work and innovation, I just thought it was important to start with some perspective about culture, as well as some hope for all who are out there trying to learn, trying to involve, trying to evolve uh, their thinking about what they do, how they do it, where they do it. Uh, and, and I think it's important to remember that at its core, organizational culture is really about mission about values as, as our foundation, uh, things that unify a workforce uh, that are then supported by a wide range of practices, you know, routines, habits that we develop to execute against that mission. But the good news is that you know things like mission, vision, values, uh, they are location independent. They are not dependent on where you are at any point in time. And you know, again, this is not necessarily something all that new. There are organizations that we've worked with all across the world that have had various levels of remote work. Uh, you know, some some with hybrid approaches. Some almost 100%. If you think about some technology companies, if you think about professional service type firms, uh, even if you think about specific roles in organizations, maybe salespeople who spend most of their time on their road on the road or uh, customer service people who spend a lot of time working from home dealing with uh, customer service issues. Uh, so, you know, high levels of remote work and some version of a hybrid approach, I, I think they've been around for a long time. Um, the pandemic did force many organizations to uh, to move a little bit more quickly, uh, to adopt uh, remote working or expand it in some ways that I'm sure they didn't expect or anticipate. And so while, while many who are unaccustomed to telework and remote working, I think will you know, continue to struggle for a while with that concept. 
you know, we do believe that the recognition that company culture is not dependent on your proximity to your coworkers is a perspective that is probably long overdue. And just to reinforce that point, I mean, at Denison for decades now, you know, we've certainly had the opportunity to assess, help develop cultures, leaders. And in that process, there's a lot that we've learned uh, about what makes for an effective organization. And, and we think it's actually, you know, pretty encouraging to note that the variation we see across cultures, across performance in organizations, um, seems to have very little to do with the physical proximity of people's coworkers. Uh, we've certainly seen primarily virtual organizations, virtual teams that really excelled at the work that they do. They had strong connections among their team members. They were unified around a common mission and purpose. They had shared goals. They could establish effective working norms. Uh, they were customer centric. They supported, they learned from each other. Uh, all the things that we know that contribute to a high performing group. Uh, and then we've seen organizations and teams where people were physically co-located and they really struggled to perform uh, across any level um, in spite of that physical proximity. And so I think we've concluded long before COVID-19 that kind of the what you do together, uh, how you do it together is much more important than where you do it from. And so we think that's just an important perspective to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, but we also wanna talk about some of the other trends and challenges of hybrid work, some of the lessons we've learned and some of the fundamental beliefs and assumptions that we're uh, sort of testing each day as we go into the workplace or log into the workplace. Uh, so with some of those trends and challenges, it just, um, Brian, I'm just going to jump sure. in real quick is yes, reflecting please. on what you were just talking about. I'm thinking about last month when Dan Dennison um, was here with our webinar and he was posing the question to all of us around uh, what's the value of face to face, you know, real time in person. And I think to your point of uh, this notion of, yeah, there's a digital culture. And so, you know, your question as a leader, part of your, you know, strategic priorities looking forward is, you know, answering that question, you know, when, where, and why do we have to be real time, you know, face to face in person, or is it hybrid? So the, the value of that, you know, is, is what I was hearing wedged in your cases. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the, um, you know, the, that's a, an important question, one that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about toward, <clears throat> excuse me, towards the end, but it is an important question that when, where, and how, and, and how we're using that face-to-face -face time and why we use it uh, the way we do. And I think at, at some level, that's, you know, really been part of the impetus for this whole, whole notion of future of work. So a lot of the organizations we talk to today are referring to future of work. And for some, they're seeing a future that looks very different than what, what their current work environment looks like. For others, it's more about incremental uh, progress towards something that uh, is perhaps different. But, you know, trying to figure out, you know, is there a hybrid model that works well for them? What are the skills? Uh, what are those be technical skills? What are the soft skills that are gonna be needed? What are the leadership competencies that will be needed uh, in the future? So we're, we're certainly seeing a lot of organizations wrestle with that topic. Uh, I think it's important we also remember that while there's been a pandemic going on across the world, there's also been a lot of emphasis on social justice and how do we create a more just, uh, you know, workplace, a more equitable workplace. And this notion that diversity, equity, and inclusion is more uh, about the culture that you create and a culture that helps facilitate diversity, equity, and inclusion versus something that we need to comply to. Uh, this notion of individual choice and flexibility and this the tension it creates 
between that and the organization's need for alignment and structure. Uh, when it comes to choice and flexibility, there's a lot of studies out right now differing uh, exact percentages, but you know, roughly saying that somewhere around 50, 60% of employees are uh, looking for, would consider a similar job if it offered them a more flexible work environment. Something like 70% of employees who are saying that if their work environment becomes less flexible than it is today, they would consider leaving their organization. But we also know that work needs to get done and it's got to get done in an aligned way. It's got to get done in, in somewhat of a structured way. So that's creating some real dynamic tension. Uh, innovation, which is I know something you'll speak to in just a moment here, uh, Margaret, but innovating how work gets done today and for the future, as, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I think a lot of organizations are saying we were innovative we were able to adapt and create change very early on in the pandemic, uh, but it was more or less in the service of getting what we already needed to do done, not necessarily with an eye towards the future. And you know, one of the other things, uh, and I think we saw this in the polls where organizations are, uh, some are just getting to that point where they're taking the time to reflect learn about what's worked, what hasn't worked for them uh, over the last 12, 18 months, and how do they apply those learnings going forward. So these are just some of the trends challenges that we'll you know, talk about here, but uh, I, I do want to point out that not too long ago, maybe two months ago, we did have a global forum where a lot of these topics were discussed. And we had some great presenters from a wide range of client organizations from across the world that you can go and access those presentations that cover a lot of these topics, or at least give some perspective on a lot of these topics. Um, but with that, let me stop there. And I think uh, we have another opportunity for some audience participation. So would you like to tee this one up, Margaret? Sure, we were curious to hear from our audience. Um, what were you, finding um, in terms of organizational practices or the, the general sense, the cultural sense that, um, hey, we need to get back. We need to return to pre-pandemic because we've got to, we never got it right during the pandemic. Um, or are you finding that there are some practices that they worked really well, but, um, you know, they're not reflected. Um, we haven't really taken time to think about those yet. Or there's some practices where um, you're in the, the your organization's in the process right now of reviewing those and trying to decide, hey, which ones do we want to build on or let go of? Or maybe you've already incorporated some of these practices that were working well. And then, you know, there's a few organizations that built in, you know, even early on or partway through the last 18 months, this idea of let's continuously reflect. Um, on our practices and transform our culture to make sure we remain agile in the VUCA world. So if the audience could select one of these five um, to best represent what you understand, um, you know, the organizational practices, the trends that you've seen, you know, through the last 18 months and let's see what our audience said. Like this is like let's make a deal. I'm waiting to open up the curtain and see what's behind the door. Yeah, I can I can see the responses in real time, and uh, yeah, I think you know the good news is that uh, at least a number of organizations seem to be in the midst of reviewing their practices, uh, and somewhere near a third, uh, just above a third have been continuously reflecting. So back to you, Margaret. Yeah, I mean, that that's fantastic. Um, you know, and that really there's a, a very small percent that is saying, hey, we need to go back, <laughs> you know, or, or we didn't get anything right. So I, I think that's, you know, hopeful news. Um, you know, we're all trying to figure it out and 
reflect and learn and change. And we may not have the perfect formula, um, uh, but I'm really inspired by, you know, the, the amount of individuals that have said, hey, look, we're, we're building in this way to continuously reflect. And that's more like the idea of the, you know, agile strategy process, having it be an ongoing process, you know, just similar to action planning, you know, what many of these culture transformation journeys that were represented in the global forum we're talking about, it's not only looking at the their cultural diagnostic results, but building in an ongoing action planning and then reevaluating again and adjusting, reevaluating. So uh, this is really promising. Yeah, what we thought we'd do next is, um, so Brian and I were involved in a project, I would, I'll call it more of a support role project um, with Chris Bullock. And um, Chris has a background, he was at Home Depot, he now leads a, a program at Northeastern University for project managers. And uh, during uh, the last 18 months, you know, was really saying, hey, this is an opportunity to explore some of these questions that we've just been talking about, you know, with the global pandemic and organizations are trying to navigate these different work arrangements. And really his questions were around, so if, if the assumption is we want to cultivate innovative workplaces, what might be the impact or effect of our managerial relationships? How have they shifted like pre-2019, pre-pandemic to now during these hybrid or remote work arrangements? Uh, as well as, you know, the psychological safety, the, the sense of that, and how does that in turn impact, you know, the innovative uh, behaviors? And so it was a, a survey instrument that went out, 108 responses. Uh, majority of the respondents were mid-career professionals, um, IT operations, management, administration. Um, most of them had about a third of them had 10 or more years of experience, you know, in organizational practice. About a third, you know, three to five years, and maybe a third of the respondents, you know, one to two years in their organization. There were across um, industries, IT, education, financial services, the professional services, and construction. And so it was interesting to see some of these, uh, some of the results that they had. Overall, 89% um, of those who responded to the survey, the 108 that responded, um, said that they had shifted towards this remote work. And then in terms of comparing what they saw pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, interestingly enough, those three areas, uh, the leader member or managerial relationships, um, innovative behavior and psychological safety, all saw an increase you know, in their scores um, during this time. So you know, we're often having this question of, so what impact did this remote work have? Are we more or less innovative or not? So this is actual real research that, you know, was um, conducted and found this, uh, found this findings. And so there were some other themes that came out. So there were both um, quantitative methods, but there were also qualitative questions and open-ended questions. But the general themes around both were this idea of emerging technologies for some that really was enhancing, you know, this ability to curate innovative workplaces, um, that the shift to remote work communication platforms, that those were the area of challenge or area of need. Um, definitely individuals were reporting out that their informal um, work connections um, you know, we're down obviously, and there was an increased sense of social uh, social social isolation. Um, but again, interestingly enough, all three of the scores overall went up. The ones that went up the highest were innovative behavior and psychological safety, um, and then slightly with managerial behaviors. And the managerial behaviors, there was an item on there that asked um, about my manager is more inclined to uh, support me, um, you know, with an initiative. And that score actually went up in 2020. So it's interesting that in the day of remote work, employees saw their managers being more supportive. There are three other really interesting questions or results that came out, and then we'll talk about kind of this impact around, you know, hybrid leadership. One was around this question we just asked the audience around organizational practices. What should we continue? What do we need to develop and what should end? 
So continue, 85% of the respondents said, let's continue with remote or hybrid work. What needs to be developed is better collaboration tools, you know, digital platforms. And what they said needed to end was punching time clocks, daily virtual check-ins, and the stigma of remote work. There were a lot of comments um, around the respondents that felt that, um, you know, there's too much, uh, the shift to surveillance during remote work. In terms of their suggestions for a healthy, innovative workplace, they had four that were in the top uh, adaptive technology to encourage enhancing collaboration, again, the flexible hybrid work, and then building out um, creative resources, time, you know, space, and funding. Um, in terms of the managerial relationships, um, overall, there was this positive shift towards the managerial relationships. Uh, People who filled it out said they felt supported and that there was an increase in trust. What uh, did um, scores did go down was this idea of the role clarity, social interactions. Um, and so some of the implications for this, um, you know, that we have for our leadership practices as well as our culture is thinking about what's the capabilities that our managers have or what are we doing to develop some of those and what are ways in our culture and in our um, organizational structures that we can build out this sense of connection um, and, you know, that just the importance of building out, you know, these trusting relationships. So I'll just uh, pause there. Uh, any other thoughts on that, um, Brian? Because I know you were, you were part of the outside group that took a look at, look at this work. I think you've summed it up quite well. And I, you know, it just reminds me of you know, the ongoing sort of struggle through the years that managers, leaders have, again, between this tension, the, uh, how, do I, how do I be supportive? How do I coach, mentor, uh, help the people around me versus uh, what, like you described it today, feels like surveillance, you know, another word for, you know, perhaps micro, feeling micromanaged. And I think, you know, in, in a face-to-face uh, -face work environment, those conversations can be, can be more casual. They can be more spur of the moment and maybe harder sometimes to tell is my manager trying to support me here or is he or she trying to figure out what I'm up to. Um, I think sometimes uh, in a more virtual environment, uh, it, it can feel because someone has to take the time to reach out, try to connect uh, it's easier perhaps for employees to distinguish sometimes between where, when they feel like they're getting support versus when they feel like they're being sur surveilled. So, uh, but I think you summed it up quite well. Yeah, and I, again, I think this, um, you know, for me though, the positive news about this research study and to your point before Brian about, you know, these digital cultures, that the fact that actually innovation behaviors uh, went up, those scores went up. Um, relationship with managers where there was capable managers that, you know, provided those supporting, trusting relationships using digital platforms, you know, those, you know, increased it too. And, you know, the, the psychological safety, that idea is this notion of, you know, risk-taking ability, um, collaboration and learning from failure. Those areas, those three areas were some of the highest increases in the scores and people in remote work reported out taking more initiative to do self-directed learning and self-directed development um, and you know reported out being more open to risk taking um, and experimentation so I thought that was you know really interesting to to see the jump in those scores um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to redo this, uh, readminister this again, just to see what does this look like in 2022. So let's go ahead and um, engage our audience again and, um, you know, ask each of you to, um, you can, in this one, you can click, uh, click on all those that apply um, around some of the challenges that you might be facing, whether that's, you know, onboarding a new employee or, um, help you in a remote work, how do you help your employees or supervisees understand who do they go to for what information or this informal culture that we can seem to be able to navigate better when we're face-to-face -face or co-located? 
Um, the idea of, you know, how do you develop these deep relationships, these trusting relationships, whether it's with our customers or what are our colleagues? Um, so how do you, how do we build out the sense of connection um, in these hybrid relationship, um, hybrid work arrangements, you know, social connections, informal connections, organic connections. Um, you know, the challenge of, you know, building out managerial capabilities um, so that our managers have the, the tools and trainings and the know-how to foster these trusting relationships, but in a digital environment. Um, and then also, you know, the challenge of how do you replicate this organic partnerships, you know, or building out these, you know, organic knowledge sharing, you know, or learning communities when you've got these dispersed global networks, whether it's employees or clients or partners. So again, feel free to click on as many as apply um, for what you're feeling like are some of the leadership challenges in remote work. And let's see what our, uh, where our audience has to say. have to build in a music aspect of this. Yeah, we need we need a drum roll uh, as we're about to unveil. Although, uh, you know, one observation I'll make uh, is, again, watching the uh, results coming in live here is, I think even though the first two that are talking about onboarding and informer, informal culture, uh, are uh, among the lower ones that we see there. Uh, onboarding did take a little bit of a spike right towards the end there. Uh, but I think there's some relationship there because uh, it does seem like onboarding of new employees is something we're hearing a lot of organizations talk about, concerns about, you know, how do they do that? Not just from a technical skills capability, but how do you induct people into the culture of the organization? And I think there's also a, a relationship to that second item about the informal culture, which is, I think, part of the concern is if you've already had existing relationships, if you're not being onboarded into an organization, if you had existing relationships, you feel pretty confident that you understand that informal culture, you have your go-to people to seek out. But for the newer employees coming into an organization, how do they develop those sort of go-to relationships? So I, I think there's some, some connection at least between those two. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, the highest score here is about, you know, building out these managerial capabilities, um, you know, digital capabilities, you know, to have, you know, so that it doesn't feel like surveillance, so it feels more, you know, organic, um, you know, personal, and that, you know, there's the development of trust with each other. So you can increase your experimentation, sharings of lessons learned, and even learning from failures, um, you know, whether those are in, you know, town halls or huddles or one-on-ones, you know, cultivating that um, space and that cultural value around it. It, it is really important for us to, you know, be open, be transparent, and you know, have honest dialogues um, and share that type of information with each other. All right, I know we are. Um, oh, do we hit a second one? Um, so to that end, you know, hybrid innovation is the name of our overall series, and we're going to dive further into this topic as we go forward with the webinars. And one of the um, pieces we wanted to hear from all of you in terms of innovation. So you heard from the study that they uh, they found that there was an um, increase in innovative behaviors in remote work. Um, it, was, it was a surprise finding but that people felt more open to risk taking. But what are you seeing, you know, in terms of innovative behaviors during, you know, 2020, 2021? Did, did things just stall out and there was no experimentation? Or uh, maybe you saw some experimentation, but it was less than pre-pandemic? Um, or perhaps it was about the same amount. It might have been slightly, you know, 
different areas of experimentation, but it was about the same amount. Or you saw, you know, an uptake or incremental increase, um, especially in the past six months. Um, or maybe, you know, your organization is, you know, transformed um, and is really capitalizing on a, a lot of these emerging opportunities. And so innovation is on the rise. So let us know how you're feeling about any of those five trends, you know, stalled out, no experimentation, less than pre-pandemic, about the same, incrementally increasing, or, um, you know, we're off to the races, we're off to the moon. And again, as I'm watching some of these results come in, it, it does seem to align uh, pretty closely to what we're seeing in the marketplace, which is, you know, a few examples uh, of efforts that have stalled or just not even getting out of the gate from an innovation perspective. But, you know, more, more of the incremental improvement. Uh, so let's yeah. take a look. Yeah, well, Brian, you're right on. So it looks like the past six months, you know, the 58%, you know, saw some incremental increase, um, you know, around their experimentation, their innovative behavior. Uh, that's probably the strongest area. Uh, a little dispersion around, you know, the same amount as before. Um, and then we have a few audience members who, speak to, you know, that they were transforming their approach to innovation and really been able to capitalize on, you know, some of these emerging opportunities. That's super exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. it's a good segue into, you know, the next piece here um, in terms of you know, some of the learnings that we've uh, been capturing, things that we've learned thus far. I'll go through some of those pretty quickly so that we may still have time for a question or two at the end. But, uh, you know, we've certainly talked in previous webinars, we talked a little bit about this earlier today, that, um, you know, for organizations where we had some pre-pandemic culture data and then we were able to capture data during the pandemic, we did see, much like in our own cultural results, generally higher scores uh, when it comes to uh, things like adaptability and innovation. But we also know that a lot of those changes and in innovations were, as I mentioned earlier, earlier in large part, sort of driven by necessity and how do we keep doing the work that we're expected to do versus you know, elevating that work. Uh, so more innovation, more change, but towards what end? is part of the question and then we also know that some aspects of working uh, did get more challenging over the last uh, 15 18 months uh, collaboration across teams you talked about that a little bit earlier margaret from a coordination standpoint we talked about the onboarding of employees um, some of the longer term planning and uh, strategizing work that you uh, also referenced earlier uh, we hear a lot of organizations, leaders, teams talking about uh, how do you create those moments of serendipity in the organization, that ability to, to recognize some of the environmental cues that might have been more uh, you know, prevalent when you were face to face with folks. I think psychologists sometimes talk about primary experiences where all of your senses are uh, you know, involved in um, versus secondary experiences where it's, uh, you know, l a, a bit less emotional, uh, probably more what we experience in some of our virtual settings. Uh, we also know that there's been the challenge of achieving that healthy work-life balance. Uh, a lot of people feeling like they're working harder just to sustain the level of productivity that they had before, uh, giving, uh, uh, giving feedback to one another. Um, that's, you know, these are some of the things that we've noticed that, that some organizations are struggling with. Um, from an organizational learning perspective, uh, we saw this in some of our polls and we've certainly heard this from a lot of organizations. I think a lot of groups are really struggling with 
can we take the time? When will we take the time to pause, reflect, and think about what we've learned? Um, we have a uh, habits, routines matrix that we use at Denison sometimes that can be a really useful tool to talk about old habits, new habits, good habits, bad habits. You know, what are the old habits we want to keep? that serve as well, what are the ones that we need to perhaps try to leave behind? What are some things that we've tried that are showing some potential, but we need to rethink? And then what's working? Uh, what can we develop that has the uh, impact that we're looking for? Uh, but I also did want to take a minute to just talk a little bit about, you know, how I think this pandemic has in some respects had us, you know, challenge some of our fundamental beliefs and assumptions about a few things. Um, some questions that I think we should be asking ourselves in organizations today. Uh, one being, you know, do we see culture as something that's just a thing, something that's relatively static, or do we see it as something that's more dynamic, uh, something that's constantly evolving? And I think about that in the context of your points, Margaret, about strategy versus strategizing. You know, culture is something that's always emerging. And so I think it's just important that people, you know, think about the fact that the culture is not this static thing. We often get clients talking about the culture as though it's this one thing. It's a complex system, but it is always evolving. Uh, another interesting question that I think organizations should be wrestling with right now is, and it's kind of an interesting one, you know, what's the purpose of a physical workplace? I don't know that many of us ever ask that question. In some cases, it's very obvious if we're in manufacturing, warehousing, other kinds of uh, facilities that uh, where the facility, facility is the place where work gets done. But you know, what's the purpose of a physical workplace? Is it where most, if not all, of the work gets done? Because if it is, that's you know, we develop a whole range of habits, routines, and practices that are designed to manage work in the workplace. Uh, but could the workplace be something different? Could it be used primarily as a place to create stronger personal bonds among colleagues? Um, one thing that came to my mind is like, does on-site become the new off-site? People used to go off-site to talk about strategy, to talk about creativity, uh, to do team building. Maybe on-site becomes the new off-site where on-site is where we use that time. And I know we're taking some efforts at Denison to do that, to, to bring people together on-site to think about strategy, to, to help articulate, clarify some of the key, key priorities, to work on those close personal relationships and develop ourselves as a team. So I think asking ourselves, what is the purpose of our workplace when we think about it in a physical workplace uh, is a really important uh, question for organizations and leaders to ponder as they think about what this hybrid environment might look like. So I'm gonna stop there because I know we're up close to the top of the hour here, but Nellie, maybe you can share a little bit about things to come. And uh, if there are a question or two we can squeeze in, we'll try to do that too. Yeah, we do have some good questions and, and we'll try our best um, in, our, in our sales team to follow up and answer those questions for you. Um, but just a, a quick overview of some of the upcoming events we have scheduled. We have several certification workshops scheduled from August through December. We also, as Brian and Margaret both mentioned, have our Global Forum resources, which are available um, in recordings and also the presentations are available on our website. And obviously we have the continuation of this series, which will um, take place on the last Thursday of each month. And as a, as a just a reminder for today, we will be sending out the recording and the, the deck from today's session to everyone who joined us. And we also have um, our thought leadership transform articles where we update thought leadership and have publications from various people on our team um, and our knowledge center, which has a, a large number of resources. Those are just always available to everyone on our website. And then uh, lastly, we just encourage anyone who is interested to take our survey demo, uh, send it to anyone who may be interested or want to learn more about our culture survey demo. But these are some of the things we have available and um, we would love for you to join any of those conversations and get in touch with any of our team members um, if you have any questions or want to learn more about any of these events. But that's all that we have scheduled for today. Um, thank everyone. Thank you everyone for joining and so, so glad you could be with us. 
and we'll send all of this as follow-up to everyone. That's great. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Really appreciate the time today. Look forward to looking at the questions you send in. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Margaret. See everyone soon. Bye-bye.